you had the really unique opportunity to to really get into the records of Gordon Wasson um, and sort of un- understand like who he really was and what his motivations were um, and all of that. Uh, what, what, what really surprised you? What is something about Gordon Wasson that no one really appreciates or understands, I guess? Okay. Well, this is another one of the, the, the turning points in my own, um, perspective in this field of psychedelics. And you're right. I, you know, when I was first getting interested in this subject in the late 1970s and early eighties, there was, um, there was uh, nothing really going on in the university or in the media or even really much in in society. Well, well where I lived, there was. I lived in. I moved to Santa Cruz, California, which was like a little place and a kind of island where there was a lot of '60s spirit and counterculture people. And I became interested in these drugs, and so I went around. I wanted to learn everything I could about them, and and so. I literally just went around to the people who had introduced them into the culture. And you know, like, I went to Harvard and I organized a symposium there. And I got to know, I went into Richard Schulte's office and Schulte's introduced me to Gordon Wasson. And so the next thing I know, I'm, I'm sitting in Wasson's house. Now, Wasson, at that point, in my point of view was you know one of the just t- any, one of the towering figures in this field he's the guy who quote unquote discovered the sacred mushroom and and uh, was a hobby of his and then he wrote about the role of the mushroom in these you know very highly respected scholarly tombs and about the role of the mushroom in ancient Greece and in and in uh, India and Mesoamerica and then finally toward the end in Christianity and I was, um, he liked me, he welcomed me into his life, he invited me to live at his home, and I hung out with him. And, um, and then a few years after he died, I wanted to make a documentary film about his life, and I got a grant from a foundation, and the family gave me the copyrights to his books, and, um, and then I got this, like, uh, carte blanche into his archives, which had been um, bequeathed to Harvard University. Harvard gave me a corner office in the herbaria, and I had a secretary, and they would bring me trays of slides and things, and I was just like a sponge absorbing everything, uh, you know, about Wasson. Well, at, at some point in this, in fact, <laughs> kind of funny, I was at, I was uh, Rick Doblin, and I were still friends at that point, and I was. I was living in Doblin's attic during the, you know, a couple of months. I would every so often I would come up to Cambridge and Rick would host me in his attic. And I was going through the Wasson archives and I, I veered off into um, away from his mycological research, his mushroom studies, into his personal correspondences. And I started to realize some kind of striking things that, um, you know, it was always kind of, an irony or is that that Wasson that the psychedelic movement was introduced by a guy who was a Wall Street banker that's really all we knew that he was a Wall Street banker and he worked for JP Morgan nobody really ever went any deeper than that i you know i had a background in modern american history and i knew a little bit about some of these guys and i you know i, I started looking in and finding out that Wasson wasn't a banker exactly, and a guy in terms of a guy who worked with money, really. He was a guy that worked with public relations. And the bank he worked for, J.P. Morgan, wasn't so much a, I mean, it was a bank, but it was really a, a very powerful political force, a, a fascist political force. And here's Wasson in charge of public relations, propaganda for the bank, like mind control, basically. You know, he was, I found out later that he was, uh, he was uh, an affiliate w- with um, Edwin Bernays, you know, who's a, another guy that serious scholars of this mind control apparatus will know or need to study. Yeah, Edward Bernays, is that right? Edward Bernays, yeah, Edward Bernays. Uh, an excellent film uh, by the BBC, The Century of the Self, gets into a lot of Bernays. But, um, you know, I found that Wasson was like, Drinking buddies with people like Alan Dulles mm-hmm. and, uh, and George Kennan. We'll just stop at those two for a second because 
again, students of American history will know Alan Dulles. Well, you know, Alan Dulles is not exactly a terrific guy. He was one of the first uh, directors of the CIA. Before he was a director of the CIA, he was a um, uh, manager of a, a bank or something that was in charge of investing the money of the Third Reich in American Wall Street. You know, he's basically like a banker for Hitler. And um, and he, then he helped set up the CIA and he helped um, pave the way for Nazi war criminals, quite a many of them, we really don't know, to come to sort of secretly even Nazis that were convicted at Nuremberg for war crimes and things found a way to sneak them back into this country so the Third Reich could resume their globalist agenda under the guise of fighting communism. And this, this is Wasson, and Alan Dulles also started MKUltra. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of interesting and a little bit disturbing. And then a few years later, see... Okay, so the anniversary of this article, Lawson goes down to Mexico and discovers Maria Sabina, this Mazatec curandera, and, and has this mushroom experience and writes about it in Life magazine. And suddenly, you know, a million readers, I don't know how many people read Life magazine, but it was the most popular periodical in America. Suddenly, this is like news. There's this magic mushroom. And we were first told that this article was just like a human interest story. This banker had a little hobby studying mushrooms and, you know, on his days off, he studied mushrooms and then on a vacation, he went to Mexico and then told this story and, and now it's really exciting. But that's not the, oh, oh, and the other part of the official story is that the, the CIA took an interest in this and they snuck in to his expedition. And um, <clears throat> and Wasson didn't want the CIA to be involved, he said, and but they snuck in anyway. And um, and this article got published and soon, you know, it begins to snowball and there's this all this interest in these magical mushrooms. But that's not the true story at all. A few years later, when I was um, still working on this, I learned and Colin Ross is a is another name that serious students will want to underline and read his book about the MK Ultra and mind control. Uh, Colin Ross found these documents that show that it wasn't an accidental um, secret infiltration of the CIA into Wasson. The CIA was behind the thing from the beginning. They paid for everything. They paid for the expedition, they paid for the, for the photography, they paid for the recording, they paid for the publication. It was the CIA's MK Ultra subproject number 58. And so we have to look now, we have to step back and go, huh, here's the CIA, which is a, an organization that it's, that, whose charter expressly forbids um, being involved in domestic affairs it's supposed to be a foreign intelligence gathering operation. But here they are paying for this powerful psychedelic drug to be introduced into American society in this phony story. Now, what? Now, why is that? So that was a very big turning point for me because um, I knew Wasson. And um, we talked about this. I interviewed him. I, I recorded this conversation. I published it in my first book, which um, I'm still very proud of. It's, a, it's a, an important book, Entheogens and the Future of Religion, where you'll find this um, full interview with Wasson where he tells this lie. And that was kind of personally offensive to me, that I was now put in a place to kind of parrot this false story and deceive the American public, or at least my readers, about the origin of this psychedelic movement. And it wasn't, it wasn't like a human interest story. It was a CIA mind control operation. And that's where we need to really begin. Like, huh, why did the CIA want to publicize this mushroom and start this new kind of faux spiritual movement? In the 1950s, you know, that's a, I mean, that's a PhD question right there.